What's up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. Yeah, that's right. This is the theology podcast where we bring you ideological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. And today on the podcast is theologian, therapist, ordained pastor Mark Karras, and his new book just came out recently, Divine Echoes, Mm -hmm. subtitled Reconciling Prayer with the Uncontrolling Love of God. And we're going to talk about prayer and the problem of evil and divine action and what that looks like in congregations and all sorts of other stuff. It's a great conversation. Going to be tons of fun. So enjoy it. And then say to yourself, huh, I want to I wanna check this book out. And then go get it, you know? That's what good books are for. Reading. Uh, you also notice that this book is inspired by the one and only Thomas J. Ord, who wrote the book, The Uncontrolling Love of God. So Tom's been on the podcast quite a few times. And here's Mark bringing insights as a therapist and a, and a minister with the theological connections to reflect on prayer. And um, it's a great, great conversation. Now, before we jump in, I want to tell you a few things. One, one thing, one thing. Theology Beer Camp. This August in Asheville, North Carolina, the 16th to 18th. Theology Beer Camp. Boom, shaka laka 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 laka. I just got back. I brewed some beer at Habitat Brewing Company, where the event's going to be taking place. There's a very limited number of tickets, and we're getting near half of them already sold out. Uh, so you want to hop on that, go to theologybeercamp.com. I've already told you a few of the people that are going to be there. A few. But we're making more announcements soon and very soon. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. And it, look, Okay, I'll go ahead and tell you. Some of my friends that are podcasters are going to be there. And we have, we have, uh, okay, I'm not telling you. They're going to be announced. It'll be in the homebrewed email this week. It'll be up on theologybeercamp.com. But there's a number of theologically attuned ladies who podcast. They're going to be at Theology Beer Camp. That's all I'm going to say. But you should check it out, theologybeercamp.com. And I want to, I want to give a shout out to Anthony new member of Homebrewed Christianity Community. Oh, Anthony, thank you, Sir Deacon. That's right. Anthony is supporting Homebrewed Christianity. And you can too. Go to homebrewedcommunity.com. You can get yourself an ecclesiastical title. That's right. You can donate every month. Support the podcast. And everything that happens here at Homebrewed Christianity, you'll get access to all sorts of special stuff. And um, the other part is, you can get your ecclesiastical title. You say, I've always wanted to be a bishop. I've always wanted to be an elder or a deacon or an acolyte with very low requirements. Like if you already listen to this podcast, you already are doing what you need to do. So just go to Homebrew Community, join up, support the podcast, connect with all the peeps in the Facebook group. And in the next few months, we have a whole new website and a whole new community experience coming out. Been working on it for a while. Super excited about it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, last thing, I just want to tell you, I have been doing edits on a couple of the books in the Homebrewed Christianity series. That's right, the Fortress Press series. I've been, I the Homebrewed Guide to Being Human is about to come out um, in just a couple months. Then the Homebrewed Guide to the Spirit is coming out. The Homebrew Guide to Being Human is written by Donna Bowman. She was on the podcast recently. And then uh, Grace G. Sun Kim wrote The Guide to the Holy Spirit, and that's coming out. And then um, The Guide to the Old Testament is, uh, is, is, about, is about done. I'm reading it right now. And it's good. And they talk about, look, Rolf Jacobson, he wrote it. And he talks a lot about Abraham and Sarah. You'd be amazed. It's like it's like Genesis is in the Old Testament. He's writing an intro to it. <laughs> anyway, I'm looking forward to y'all checking those out. And remember, remember, um, nothing says love like giving the gift of homebrew Christianity guys to your friends. All right? <laughs> anyway, uh, here is my new friend Mark, and we're talking about his book, Divine Echoes. 
prayer, theodicy, superstition, intervention, uh, social justice, and how, what prayer looks like in a petitionary prayer. Do you want to do it anymore? Mm-hmm. It's a zesty one. Enjoy. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and I'm with Mark Harris, who is the author of Divine Echoes. Oh, yeah, Divine Echoes. It is a book about prayer inspired by some excellent open and relational theological reflection by Thomas J. Ord. Thank you for joining us, Mark. How are you? Uh, doing well, Trip. Great to be here. Excited to talk about the book and, uh, and the other tangential subjects that uh, come about. So, um, first off, I think you want to let us in a little bit about yourself. On top of being yeah. an ordained minister, you're also a therapist. You, and then mm-hmm. this book demonstrates you're you're actively engaged in 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 theology. So, so where was it in your own life that this kind of three hatted vocation came on the horizon? Wow, I I think it's it also the reasons or the foundation for why and who I became who I became is actually probably the main reasons why I wrote this book. So I I think maybe I can answer both questions at the same time. You know, I think it's a whole lot of trauma. Uh, And and what that looks like is, you know, growing up, mom was basically a a drug addict for most of my life. And and I uh, became a Christian probably maybe 20, around 21, a little older now. But that uh, that was a pretty crazy environment. And then stepfather was in the Pagans, 350-pound, tatted guy. And there was drugs. There was violence. There was all kinds of uh, things that were pretty chaotic. But when I became a Christian, I, you know, I became really burdened for my mom. And I remember you know, just praying fervently uh, for her, my church praying fervently for her. We wanted her to be delivered. We wanted her to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. And time would go on, and I never uh, stopped praying for her. And then, unfortunately, she did die from a drug overdose. But my my mom wasn't the only family member who I was praying for. And then we come to my younger brother. And he was just an incredible guy, you know, the most loving, outgoing, creative, intelligent, life of the party kind of dude. And um, one day we came home and all this stuff was thrown out at the curb. And of course, I was a bit curious. And when we went to check on my brother, he was curled up in a ball, mumbling some incoherent phrases. And that was the start uh, really of the end of his life. He wound up being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, probably one of the cruelest forms of uh, mental illness a uh, person can have. Well, let's mm-hmm. face it, they all they all suck. But of course, here again, as a Christian, I'm praying for him. The church was uh, having deliverance services for him. We actually took him to other churches where they, quote, specialized in casting out demons and stuff like that. And, you know, I tirelessly p- petitioned God. And I cried and wailed and begged and pleaded for the great physician to just snap his fingers. And so my brother's neuronal connections would fire properly again. But unfortunately, they never did. And to this day, he's tormented by one of the worst diseases of the mind a person can have. And uh, he murdered someone in prison. And he probably will never set foot out of the prison walls. And so it, it, to know why I became a therapist and why I became a pastor, uh, to know why I wrote this book, um, you know, Dallas Willard, uh, f- famous, uh, late Dallas Willard, wrote the idea that everything would happen exactly as it does, regardless of whether we pray or not, is a specter that haunts the minds of many who sincerely profess belief in God. And that specter of the failure of prayer haunted me. I couldn't shake it. Something about the the tiresome pat Christian answers didn't make sense. God has a plan. Your brother's healing is right around the corner. If you just pray and fast hard enough, God will give your brother or mother a breakthrough. 
put all that fell flat and that's kind of some of the seeds that were that birthed the book and birthed my desire to become a therapist and pastor mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so as a as an individual dealing with the 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 trauma of your mother's death the ongoing struggle and pain of your brother like how how did you and God get along well enough to end up at Drew, you know, doing uh-huh. seminary? Like I I I know that um, seminary in and of itself is a you know intense and deconstructive place, but going into it with the kind of questions those experiences give has to be different than most of us who mm. end up going into theological education. Yeah, I think what it was was a deep abiding experiential call. Um, Listen, my life was changed when I I encountered uh, Jesus and, you know, a a lot of people have testimonies, but mine is pretty dramatic. You know, I tried to kill myself and I was a cutter, depressed, no hope. So I, I think Jesus completely wrecking my world to the point where I would just cry because I felt an enormous, incredible amount of love uh, to whom is forgiven much, loves much. I was just, no matter how much of the Christian tradition was crazy, uh, because I did get saved in a cult, and that's a whole other story. Um, But something about uh, the experience of God, I couldn't let go of. And I think that propelled me to never give up on love, on God as love, and uh, propel me into seminary. So, of course, coming out of the cult, it even, you know, uh, man, it it made me think and deconstruct even more because we thought we had the truth. I thought I had the truth. Uh, You know, from that cult, we were the only ones who were saved. I couldn't hang out with people who believed in the Trinity. Um, Men couldn't have facial hair. Women couldn't even trim their hair or they would be, uh, you know, go to hell. I mean, these were, I went to, uh, you know, hanging out with a, a pastor and I told him I had wine at a wedding and he said I was in danger of hellfire. And so all of these things after getting out of that, um, that uh, forced me to have much more inquisitive mind of what is true and what is not after that. But like I said, the experience of God as love never left me even to this day. So the, the question of petitionary prayer, or intercessory prayer, is yeah. something that in the room as a therapist when you're working with an individual or as a minister when you're, when you're facilitating worship and such, uh, you can't dodge it. And yet a lot of theologians – because they're so embarrassed by some of the theological implications connected to it, kind of dismiss it, minimize it, dodge it, or do the minimal viable amount of petitionary prayer in hopes that we can move past it. And you spent some time reflecting on the relationship of God in the world, the nature of divine love, God's relationality, and really you know, are wrestling with what petitionary prayer could look like. Um, Yeah. What was it in the one-on-one conversations in your role as a minister or out of your own experience with God that made you go uh, the normal like dismissal of this type of prayer is kind of baby stuff. Uh, Where was that first resistance? First, I want to define what we're talking about. And then I want to share where my holy discontent came from. Mm -hmm. Um, So petitionary prayer is a specific form of prayer aimed at making requests of God. They make requests of God for answers to life questions and concerns. They're also pleas for God. And here's the key to be the sole responsible agent to act on behalf of the one who is praying. Petitionary prayer is going to be offered on a small and personal scale for oneself or for others or they may involve requests on a larger scale that concern changing undesirable circumstances with in society, right? We just had mass shootings. Here again, everyone is praying uh, to comfort uh, people, God to bring healing, to, to rid the nation of violence. Now, that's a whole other conversation we could talk about too. But now we're getting into the definition. 
For me, it was my holy discontent in looking at prayers and really asking, do they make a difference? Uh, Because, listen, if they don't make a difference, then a lot of people are suffering uh, unneedlessly. Like, like, for example, I give this story, and this is a perfect example of why I'm so passionate about this subject. Herbert and Catherine Schabel, a Christian couple who love God. In 2009, they suffered the tragic death of their two-year-old son, Kent. Uh, Kent died of untreated bacterial pneumonia. Why didn't they seek medical treatment for their son? Because they disregarded medical science and believed solely in the power of prayer. God was the sole agent to heal and deliver their son, right? So 2013, serving a 10-year probation for neglect of their first son, their eight-month-old son, Brandon, died from treatable bacteria pneumonia. Once again, the couple denied their children medical treatment because they believed through prayer, God would unilaterally and single-handedly, miraculously heal their child. Of course, God didn't, right? So they both suffered needlessly and died tragic deaths. But it's easy to judge those parents for neglecting their children. But how many of us, and I had to ask myself, how many of us are guilty of something similar? How many times have we prayed throughout our lives where we prayed fervently for those suffering and in distress, placing all the responsibility on God to answer our prayers, while those for whom we prayed suffered needlessly because we took no responsibility to be God's answer to our prayers? How many societal ills have gone on for decades while people pray but neglect to use wisdom and take divinely inspired proactive action to provide solutions? So that is one of the biggest reasons why I started really asking, is petitionary prayer effective? And so, and, uh, yeah. so underneath that, the questioning of the assumption in a lot of petitionary prayer that yeah. any divine response is a solo response where mm. where did the like at what point did you go oh maybe the relationship god has with the world isn't one where for god to do something god has to intervene and break all these rules and show up in the middle of a place god wasn't before but that our own responsiveness and our own contribution into each moment of the world is actually like part of how God responds to and, and shares life with the world. Mm. Can you, can you uh, pinpoint that specific question in there? Uh, Tri- well, uh, I mean, I like the language in, in how you define things. Uh, I think, yeah. it, it, I mean, it makes some of the connections with what Tom's doing. Okay. And, yeah. And yeah, his work yeah. that uh, he talks about the big, bad ideas in, Uh, uncontrolling love of god like one is when you see these situations like the ones you shared that are like heartbreaking and you're like why didn't you act responsibly well under underneath of it there's the assumption that all the power in whatever happens is either determined or permitted by god right so that when you see this ugly horrible thing you're like well god allowed it god permitted it and if you understand you know from the mystery of what being and things it all makes Mm. sense and yeah. and yeah. the resistance you're having isn't to, God, I want you to be present with us in this and to be a part of what happens. The resistance is, God, I know you are in charge completely and in control officially of whatever happens. Yeah. I mean, listen, for the longest time in my early Christian tribes, God had all the control. And when they said God is sovereign, God was sovereign over everything. Quote, everything happens for a reason, Mark. Mm-hmm. Mark, there's a purpose why you're, why you brother. And I'm like, you know, I started thinking, I said, there's no way in heaven or hell. I mean, geez, like God's will was for my mom to suffer for years with an addiction and then yeah. eventually die. For, are you kidding me? God's will was for my brother to spend the rest of his life in a crappy prison being dehumanized and any sense of life zapped from his soul. Are you kidding me? But then, you know, you look out in the world and that's what I did. And I said, there's no way. No, no. uh, Women getting raped. uh, Excuse me, Mr. Calvinist. Are you seriously going to tell me 
that that was a part of God's sovereign plan? No way. And so Thomas Ord's work, of course, really helped me as I was reflecting on these questions, right? It's not like, you know, God could have stopped this person from being raped or molested, but chose not to. It's that God literally can't because God's nature is love. And to be loving is to not force or coerce or manipulate your way into situations or people's hearts. And that was a a beautiful paradigm shift for me. Listen, I already know that God can't do things right, at least explicitly from Scripture. He can't lie. He can't be tempted. He can't be prejudiced. He can't sin. He can't get tired, Isaiah 40, 28. Could it possibly be that the reason why a lot of evil happens is because God can't intervene and unilaterally stop it? Like that's that's paradigm shifting. Mm-hmm. Because not only do a lot of people say God can but chooses not to, and this is one of my biggest issues, is the view of God in traditional petitionary prayer, it's terrible. It pushes people away from God. Right, because basically you're saying, God, of course God can. Don't don't tell me my God is not powerful enough to stop this person from murdering this person. But see, they say God does it sometimes, but not others. Right? God chooses to heal some from cancer, but not others. God chooses some to give parking spots, but God chooses not to stop this baby from being uh, killed. Are you freaking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Is that the God that we want to portray to the world? And of course, philosophers, atheistic philosophers pick up on this stuff. And they're like, yep, definitely don't want to be worshiping that kind of God. Yeah. So one of the things that interests me about this predicament and and how it shows up in individuals is uh, when you have experienced suffering and injustice in ways – a lot of times humans' natural move is to want to find a way to narrate that experience so it has meaning and purpose and value. Yeah. And oftentimes Christians will lapse into con- reconvincing themselves when they've resisted this picture of God, this more traditional omnipotent understanding of God. They reconvince themselves that it's true because it they see it as required for there to be some meaning amidst their suffering. And I think of like C.S. Lewis' problem of pain. Mm-hmm. He does that over the course of the book. And uh, early on, he's voicing this que- these type of questions and problems. And by the end, he's like, yeah, but we know God is omnipotent and God is in control and all things are working for the good. And so therefore that means, you know, um, yeah. return to this classical theism. But in a as a therapist and someone working with it, when you see um, someone who who is looking for understanding or meaning or to give some value to it, how do you help them not dismiss God like some of the atheist criticisms you point out uh, yeah. uh, highlight, but also not r- return to this more perverse picture of God as the only way of having divine comfort in the situation? Yeah. A few things. First, I, I feel like I'm in good company because you, you mentioned C.S. Lewis, and he did write uh, Petitionary Prayer, a Problem Without an Answer. And he himself wrestled with this. And he, he said, the problem I'm submitting to you arises not about prayer in general, but only about the kind of prayer which consists of request or petition. I have no answer to my problem, though I've taken it to about every Christian I know. So that gives me some solace. Uh, of course, his, his answer was to be okay with not having an answer, I think, in regards to petitionary prayer. But it gives me some solace. I'm in good company reflecting on these things. But two, as a therapist, of course, it gets a little tricky because I don't want to talk about uncontrolling. I don't want to force my views. I'm very, I'm very conscious of that, forcing my views on other people. Mm-hmm. So it, it really, the questions need to arise from them. That gives me an invitation to, uh, you know, kind of as a, uh, maybe a narrative therapist to ask different questions that would get themselves to reflect on the origin of their beliefs. I think uh, Bruce Epperly said something to the effect of, 
you know, if you, if you have issues with God, if you don't believe in God, tell me about the God that you don't believe in, right? Mm-hmm. Tell me about, because it's under there is probably, you know, uh, an autocratic, cruel God. You know, there's probably some pain in one's view of God. Maybe a, a family member, you know, was, I encounter this a lot. A family member gets killed or they suffer an accident or they, they have some kind of sickness. Where was God? Well, according to traditional petitionary prayer and understanding of God, God just chose not to heal or deliver them for whatever reason, as opposed to, and this is where I might kind of reflect with them. What if it's that God, you know, doesn't, it's not like he's picking and choosing as an arbitrarily unfair God. What if God can't? What if God is so loving? And I go into that spiel just to kind of let them reflect on it. And of course it, it opens up new pathways of thinking and reflecting on God and then, geez, I mean, if they get the book uh, or, or Tom's book, they say, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that this was another way of thinking about God. I feel kind of liberated, right? So that's always cool when they can have more freeing images of God. And that's what it's about, people's images and lenses in which they view God themselves in the world. And it's really cool when people can have some shifts that uh, feel liberating to them. Have Have you encountered individuals who, at least at where they are in, at a given point in life, that the trauma and pain and experience they've received from the church and from the uh, at least the ideology connected to their understanding of God, uh, like they need to be away and apart in, in order to reconcile move towards healing and that kind of thing yeah i mean it's that's the thing they can get apart from distance but it's not a part in their mind and heart i mean they they live as if they're still in the church they live as if the god they renounced is still there uh, watching and has an evil eye upon their lives i've experienced enormous amount of suffering uh, uh, uh people suffering Jeez, well, I suffered too because of it. Uh, spiritual abuse, uh, spiritual trauma. Just this past weekend, I uh, did a, a couple's uh, workshop, retreat style kind of workshop. And the, the lady, knowing I um, have a you know, background as a pastor, she said, I don't mean to offend you. And then she went into this tirade about the church and her family being a fundamentalist and screwing her up and being controlling and And in that moment, I was able to offer a corrective emotional experience by saying, you're so right. I'm not here to argue with you. The God that that if I believed in that God, I would have as much angst and anger and hurt and pain and sadness as you do. And I could just see her in that moment just soften because I'm, I'm on her side. And if I could be a representative of, of Jesus, uh, hopefully that did bring some kind of healing to her. Or certainly after our conversation, there, there was to some degree. But people just need compassion, empathic presence in the midst of their pain and trauma to be little Christ uh, for them, with them. And, uh, and it's because of that, then their shift in reflection on who God is can change. It's pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. It, one of the challenges that you take up in the book um, and that Ord puts out in his own work is the the need for us to rethink. We need communities and pla- and, and to rethink our understanding of divine providence and power, and that the older images of power uh, that that we in case around our readings of scripture and our live in our, in the life of the church and its worship and such, um, we can't just sit around, let those rain and then try to pick up the pieces when people's lives are torn apart because of, uh, this, you know, inherited theology. And, mm. and I'm interested in as like taking the hat of the theologian and the therapist into the life of the church, what kind of insights, advice uh, you have at 
helping people reframe their understanding of God's presence, God's the reality and nature of uh, prayer and such, so that when they encounter these intense, painful experiences, that's not the first time they ask the question of, you know, is God in control? Is God really always loving? Yeah. I mean, listen, a seed reproduces after its own kind. And it's so important for their the leadership to, you know, it's about teaching and education, educating and modeling and, and the types of sermons that, that people, uh, you know, preach and teach. Uh, you know, my concern is that some communities are guilty of what James, uh, in the book of James, warned us about, right? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But what good is it if we have prayer, but no deeds? If we see brothers or sisters in Christ without clothes or food and do nothing more than pray that God will give them peace and keep them warm and well fed, what good is it if we pray for God to take care of the homeless, but don't tangibly attend to their physical needs? But so, so my, my issue is this has to be taught, right? This, this notion that God is um, somehow we're just waiting on God to do like, listen, for me, basic needs are needs for God to love, heal, save, and deliver from most, the most fundamental obstacles of human flourishing. For example, a basic need is to be free from poverty. God never desires that people be deprived of sustenance and starved to death. Another basic need is to be free from racism and oppression. It's never God's will for people to suffer discrimination because of the way they look, for example, or because of their gender, sexual orientation, race, and so on. Or other basic needs includes the necessity of a world free from violence and genocide and a world in which healing from devastating injuries and accidents can occur, right? Like asking for our needs to be met opens us up in the moment to receive God's freely available graces in their various forms, right? We need to educate uh, the church in our, in ourselves because people are, are dying, are starving, and it's not God's fault. Like God's not, we're not waiting on God. God's waiting on us. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I, I, I'm so passionate about this. It's like, there's just not a, so the two things I'm passionate one, because I think that traditional petitionary prayer causes more harm in the world because it solely places a responsibility in God, but two, it, it mars the image of God. It makes God look uh, portrayed as unloving and God is passive and cruel in the midst of evil and suffering and thus pushes people away from God. That's why this matters and it makes a difference and part of that is teaching this stuff in the communities listen i I also wrote a uh, study guide for this book for the specific reason and i didn't bias it it's listen this is my investigation deconstruction and reconstruction of petitionary prayer through this study guide and working you know with small groups i want them to find their own uh, investigation deconstruction reconstruction of petitionary prayer but do the work Reflect on these matters, right? Because so many pastors I've talked to, oh my goodness, I, it's incredible. I asked them what prayer, what, how does prayer work? And they don't know. Or well, they'll give me, like one pastor gave me, well, Mark, um, Ian, Ian Bounds says, the concentration and aggregation of faith, desire, and prayer increase the volume of spiritual force until it becomes overwhelming and irresistible in its power. Units of prayer combined like droplets of water make an ocean which defies resistance. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? What is a volume of spiritual force? What is units of prayer? Does it have something to do with math? Like, like I'm just afraid there are so many theopoetics and theonicities that it doesn't have its feet on the ground enough, and that's that's a problem for me and, and ultimately the world. Mm-hmm. So, what um, when petitionary prayer kind of leaves behind this uh, superstitious wish fulfillment, classical understanding of God? Um, then how does it 
how do you see it changing um, the role it plays in worship and the life of the individual Christian? Yeah, I mean, listen, it makes it a more beautifully dangerous kind of faith. You know, part of part of the the resistance I'm getting for this book, and trust me, there's resistance. I'm now no longer able to uh, teach uh, or preach at a church I worked at for three years. And the church that I've been going to uh, for a while, he read the book and said, Mark, you can attend, but you can't teach or preach here either. There's so much resistance to changing this, this, this sacred cow of prayer. It's incredible. Um, and people who tell me they love the book, and then they're off doing the same kinds of prayers on Facebook. Um, it's so hard to break the mold of this, this mindset and paradigm of the traditional notion of petitionary prayer, God is control. But I think part of it is fear. Part of it is risk. Can you imagine what kind of world would it be? Now we look at mass shootings, right? And it's like, you know, we can pray God, uh, you know, be with the families of these shooting victims, pour out your grace on the surviving family members, comfort and heal their wounded hearts. That's great prayers. But listen, the God that I believe in is so loving that God is already with those families. God's grace is already with those surviving family members. God is comforting to the extent that God can comfort according to those hearts who are open and wanting and willing to receive God's love in that moment. But what if we prayed, our first prayers weren't, God, you do, but God, how can we do? And that is, that is a terrifying prayer because we are forced to actually be the literal hands and feet of God and do something much different than what we were doing previously. And as someone, myself, who can be kind of lazy, um, that forces us to get off our asses and, and actually do something really messy and hard and risky and courageous in a world that is desperate for people uh, that what Jesus would skin on. So I think part of it is fear, and, and part of it is just comfortability from doing the same thing for generations, and it's just hard to break that kind of mold. And you develop that kind of introduction of responsibility in the life of petitionary prayer by describing it as conspiring prayer. Can you, yeah. can you unpack that? Sure. I differentiate uh, cons- traditional petitionary prayer versus my understanding of what I would call conspiring prayer. I hate to call it a model. I, I, one size doesn't fit all. I don't have God's golden seal of approval on this, but I, I came up with this notion of conspiring prayer when it comes to petitionary prayer And that's a form of prayer where we create space in our busy lives to align our hearts with God's heart, where our spirit and God's spirit breathe harmoniously together, and where we plot together to subversively overcome evil with acts of love and goodness. And, you know, conspire literally comes from the Latin word conspirare, which literally means to breathe together, to act in harmony towards a common end. And I love it because today's usage, there is that subversive notion, actually negative notion to do something wrong or evil with somebody. And that's what we're doing, right? If evil had a voice, they would say, oh, my God, love is coming and I'm I'm scared and uh, this is not good. So traditional petitionary prayer. So some people could say, well, Mark, we do this already. Here's the the thing. Conspiring prayer is like two sides of a uh, coin. So on one side, there's a view of God, and the other side is practice. Some, some churches may already do conspiring prayer, right? They're listening. They're humbly being in God's presence. It's not just kind of a humanistic, well, we're going to do it, and just kind of brainstorm and coming up with our own solutions. It's really loving God, being in a relationship with God, but the view of God is very different. So, for example, in traditional petitionary prayer, like I said, God can intervene and single-handedly stop evil events from occurring. In conspiring prayer, the view of God is God can't intervene and single-handedly stop evil events from occurring. And that really bothers people. I'm not saying God doesn't do anything. I'm saying God can't, keyword, single-handedly, all by God's self, regardless of different agencies uh, in, in the event. 
The second view is in traditional petitionary prayer, God is arbitrarily loving and shows favorites. In conspiring prayer, God loves consistently and fairly. Uh, no, in my view of God and conspiring prayer, God isn't giving some parking spots while healing others uh, from cancer or not healing others from cancer. God is ma- doing everything God can in the moment to maximize love, goodness, and shalom. In traditional petitionary prayer, God intervenes on occasion. God's somehow like in the heavens, and if we just pray, God will intervene somehow in this moment. But of course, in conspiring prayer, the view of God, that side of the coin, God is moment to moment loving and maximizing the good. Traditional petitionary prayer, we get into the practice, the praying to God, uh, and in conspiring prayer, we're praying with God. We're praying with God because the very things that we're praying for, if it's true to love, and of course, if it's praying for the basic needs of people and situations, it's already in a yes and amen to God. We don't have to beg and plead God as, as if we're dogs waiting for scraps to fall off the table. And, and so in traditional petitionary prayer, God, you bring shalom in this situation. Conspiring prayer, God, how can we creatively work towards shalom? Traditional petitionary prayer, we speak, God listens. Conspiring prayer, we speak, God speaks, and we both listen. So it's very two different models of prayer. And I'm fully convinced that if churches prayed more conspiring prayers, their churches, their church communities would experience more shalom, but certainly the world at large. That is my, my guarantee. Mm -hmm. And, and so how does that change the way you use language for um, prayers for healing or in situations where you don't see hope for transformation, like your own brother's situation? Like what, what are what how do you put words on those ideas in more specific situations yeah i I do flush that out in the book because I don't want to just have theory right and so there there is the whole kind of reconstruction a chapter where I flush this out with various uh, issues, and uh, gun violence was one of them, uh, but mental illness it was another right I really had to reflect on mental illness and for me. Mental illness is downright evil. It's not part of God's will. It's not part of God's plan. Uh, Hail to the no. So that changes how um, I understand God. Like I now I hold a theodicy that understands God not to be a, scru- a cruel scriptwriter who intentionally gave my brother mental illness. And that has changed the way I pray. I, now I don't have or need to hold back cognitive dissonance in its byproduct of distrust towards God, because I know that God is doing everything that God can do for my brother. And, but there's other dynamics at play that are keeping my brother from Shalom. That's a huge shift in how I pray. I don't need to push down my anger towards God or discontent or confusion. God is doing everything that I can, uh, everything that God can. So Thanksgiving is, is different now when it comes to prayer, like I had a hard time thanking God in the midst of my brother's situation, but now I can firmly and confidently thank God in the sense that I know God is doing all God can do. Uh, and that's, that's beautiful uh, for me, but at the same time, I'm pissed and angry that there are other dynamics. One may be my brother's will, uh, but that's one of a myriad number of agencies. What about the freaking system that's in place that keeps my brother sick, right? That that doesn't enable him to have phone calls with attachment figures that are safe and secure and loving. Mm-hmm. So, or or in in cells that are dirty with shitty food, uh, no sleep. He would tell me that the guards would keep the lights on all night so that he couldn't sleep on purpose. Uh, he's been beat in prison. Uh, he he said he's been raped in prison. Listen, this is not, God has nothing to do with that. This is why in conspiring prayer, I can love God. I can thank God. I can share God, my angst. Of course, I'm still saying, God, please heal my brother. But it's not in a way that's, that, that I'm begging God. It's in a way that I know that I'm, I'm conspiring with God. The, God, the, the, the grief that I have is the same grief that God has. 
and I'm sharing that with God. That's the difference in conspiring prayer. And I'm also praying, God, what can I do different, right? Can I do anything to the system? Can I do anything creative? God, show me in this moment, what could I do for my brother? Or any situations that we're praying for. So for me, this is a game changer when it comes to prayer. It's riskier. It's more dangerous. But man, the other way is just, it contributes to more suffering and disgusting images of who God is. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. So for for those who, uh, this, uh, I mean, not just the book, but this conversation, you know, brings up their own experiences that, um, that they haven't thought through or reflected on because it could have been too painful or, or they, they look at judgments they put on God because of unexamined assumptions about God. Uh, what yeah. kind of encouragement or invitation would you give for someone who goes, like, uh, I want to begin this conversation and there's, you know, hope in me that I can reconcile in some sense with my past experiences and God and also hesitation that, uh, this is clearly different than the vision of prayer and God and providence that I've grown up with and held my whole life. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Trip. And uh, I just in this moment, as you're saying that I'm thinking there's got to be listeners who have turned away from God, who said, God, screw you. I want nothing to do with you. Um, or the very least, God is some very, very distant, uh, cold other in, in whom to just merely analyze or philosophize. But man, I, all, all I could do is say in my own journey, right? I, I, everyone's got their own journey in this situation. But God is uh, perhaps the God that we believe in is, is much more beautiful and loving uh, than we have thought. And there are Christians like myself and others who, who don't believe in an unfair, arbitrary God who gives some parking spots and not others. Uh, there are some who believe that the, that the Holocaust wasn't God's will or these mass shootings, they're not God's will. Um, they're completely anti-God in its very essence. There are, are different ways of reflecting on God. And man, I would just first say, I understand your pain. Um, if I believed in the God that you believe in, I would want nothing to do with that God either. And I would just say, man, perhaps there's just a little bit of space where you can reflect with different books uh, as if they're people or even myself. I love interacting with, with listeners and readers. There are people who want to journey with you in the midst of your pain or trauma and, and uh, share about another God uh, who is, in my mind, just as valid, who's loved and experienced and related with by hundreds of thousands of other people. Um, listen, for me, God's perfect love extends to all without the necessity of prayer. The birds do not pray, but a loving God takes care of them. The lilies do not intercede, yet God is mindful of them. Listen, the God that I believe in, it says in Matthew 5, 43, enemies and persecutors of God do not pray, but God loves them. And I love this in Luke 6, 35, the ungrateful and wicked do not pray, yet God is kind to them. There is another version of God that looks very much like Jesus, uh, that it's just an invitation, right? I, I don't want to force my view of God on anybody. But I wonder if there's just, if there's a, a hunger or curiosity for another version, pick up my book, pick up Thomas Ord's book. There are other books that kind of talk about this un, uh, controlling, non coercive, non manipulative, non forceful uh, kind of God. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to one, write the book, to share your own stories and struggles and insights. Um, I wonder if there's anything you want to add or share at the end uh, that we that didn't come up in our conversation. Yeah. You know, I'll just say some churches will have a difficult time shifting from one paradigm to another. Like I said, conspiring prayers involve uh, having courage and taking risks. It's easier to pray and let God handle it than to pray and collaborate with God. Uh, 
the anxious voices crying, but this is the way we have always done it will be plentiful. I already heard many of them already in the short release of this book. Yet for me, too much is on the line. Systemic injustices of all kinds ravage people in creation. The world cries out unawares for gospel-filled, prayed-up, kingdom-minded warriors of love. And the church should be the salt of the earth, the moonlight to the world, reflecting the love and the light of the sun in both word and deed. So a paradigm shift regarding petitionary prayer for others is in order. A powerfully loving God doesn't need to be reminded or talked into doing what is intrinsic to his loving nature. Mm -hmm. It is we, the church, who are called now more than ever to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Well, that is a that is a seriously awesome way to land a plane. <laughs> Thanks, Trip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for writing the book as well. I I know that uh, a lot of people were excited that you know Tom put into you know into a theological text a lot of the stuff he'd been working on in across you know love and science love and. Um, in yeah. religious conversations, love and and just what it looks like in a theological debates and such. Um, but the you know the reason I think a lot of people ask that question around God and love and relationship is the experiences that you shared out of your life and that I've had and others have, and yeah. uh, uh, really taking theological ideas and putting them. Um, uh, showing what a piety looks like shaped by them is a really, really uh, important task. So, thank you, Trip. Thank you.